Sequels are hard. Just ask anyone. I mean, even Pixar sequels vary wildly in quality. But for every Cars 2 or uh, Cars 3, there's a Toy Story 2 or, you know, Toy Story 3. Because when a sequel works, especially a sequel to a beloved piece of animation, it's a magical feeling. Every bit of warmth and nostalgia that you already carry for all these characters are used in service of an exciting new story. And as the sequel to 2015's lush and cinematic Ori in the Blind Forest, today's game comes with a lofty set of expectations. But Ori and the Will of the Wisps managed to recapture that magic with another gorgeous and ambitious approach to the Metroidvania genre. Hey everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. Obviously, a lot has happened in the last 48 hours here on the channel, and in the world obviously, so I want to talk about a few things quick before we start today's episode. First, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who watched the video I uploaded on Wednesday. Um, we've had over 35,000 responses out of that video, and it's been really heartwarming, really eye-opening. I've had a lot of creators reach out to me, and that's meant a lot. And I'm really thankful that a lot of you guys seem to be listening. I'm going to be taking all that feedback for the next couple of weeks and coming up with a game plan, not just for Persona 5, but for my content going forward. Nothing too drastic, nothing too crazy, but enough to make me feel like what I'm doing is important. And I've heard you guys, and I just want to say thank you. And finally, if you are at home like many of us are, obviously as you can tell, I'm in my own office at home and this isn't where I usually shoot the show, let alone where I film videos like this. Uh, yay webcams. Um, I'm gonna be streaming on Twitch uh, for the foreseeable future until things kind of get going. I will be making videos still for Beer Bros and Completionists, so don't worry about that. If you want to join the New Game Plus experience, head over to twitch.tv slash the completionist. I'm going to be playing right now Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. I have the perfect chow raised, and right now I'm currently finishing out the game. I might even be done by the time this video drops, but we'll see. Come on, join the adventure. It's a good time. We have a fantastic community, and yeah, come talk to me about life and video games. I'm really excited today to talk about Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Honestly, it's the kind of game that when I played The Blind Forest, I fell in love and I absolutely enjoyed every moment of it. It's gorgeous with a story that made me teary-eyed and I really loved embracing everything that Ori and the Blind Forest had to offer. That sense of wonder and adventure is so palpable from the first game that I am incredibly excited to look forward to this game, the sequel that just came out only a couple of weeks ago. I'm mostly hoping that this game will just send me on a emotional journey, so let's go for it, Ori. Mess me up. Let's begin. Here comes a new challenger! Yeah! Danger! Ori and the Will of the Wisps is the second game by Moon Studios, a small team of developers located all around the world with no central office. And although the size of their team has more than tripled between the first Ori game and the sequel, their unique setup still gives them a scrappy underdog quality. A small team of dedicated artists making this weird, beautiful, and ambitious series the best it can be. Instead of coasting on the success of their first game, Moon Studios brought the same level of ambition to the sequel. The game not only expands the world that Ori lives in and introduces a new set of adorable, heart-wrenching characters, but it widens the scope considerably with all sorts of side missions, collectibles, and the expanded focus on combat. In fact, Ori and the Will of the Wisps takes plenty of cues from the other major Metroidvanias of the past few years. That's right, I'm talking about Hollow Knight. And while Ori and the Will of the Wisps isn't quite as massive as that game is, Hollow Knight's influence is still readily apparent, with all sorts of challenges, boss fights, and even the introduction of swordplay. 
In many ways, Ori and the Will of the Wisps is a culmination of a decade of great Metroidvanias. Sure, there are a few technical hiccups, but this sequel combines the strengths of Hollow Knight, the first Ori game, and film influences like Pixar and Studio Ghibli to create the new gold standard for the genre. Picking up right after everyone's favorite forest spirit, Ori, saved the forest of Nybel at the end of the first game, they and their family have a new addition, Ku, an adorable little owl baby, and the child of Kuro, the first game's villain. When Ori and Ku take a flight through a storm, they end up separated and trapped in the decaying land of Nywin, which is ruled over by a massive deformed owl creature known as Shriek and is somehow even more terrifying than Kuro was in the first game, which means it's up to Ori to find the scattered pieces of the forest's light, now known as the Will of the Wisps, in order to save Ku, defeat Shriek, and restore order to the land of Nywin. Instead of energy attacks from the first game, Ori now uses an energy blade, which immediately makes combat a much bigger part of the game. Plus, there's now a much wider range of skills and attacks, including a bow and arrow, a healing ability, and Ori's classic bash move, which freezes time so you can point an arrow before pushing off of an enemy and launching you into that direction. And then there's one of Ori's big nods to Hollow Knight and its charm system. Rather than the branching skills of the first game, there's a large number of equipable shards, which can be upgraded and swapped out as the situation demands. But the shards are just one of about a zillion collectibles in the game, many of which can be gathered during side quests for the Moki, adorable cat creatures that need help rebuilding their village. You can also gather Gorlak ore for construction projects, seeds to plant that open up new pathways, and life and energy cells that help you store more, uh, well, life and energy. I'm actually excited about all of that collecting because it just means more time looking at the beautiful art design and listening to that incredible soundtrack. The only thing that really has me worried at all is the achievement list, which wants me to do a speed run in under four hours, a run without using any charms or spending any currency, and a run in which I don't die a single time. The Deathless run was definitely the hardest thing about the first game, and I'm not super stoked about doing it again, given how much larger this game is. But I'm even more worried about some of the glitches I've been hearing about. I'm always nervous about something getting in the way of the completion process, but in the case of the Ori games, I'm more concerned that a technical issue might affect my enjoyment of the game's story. A good sequel honors the story that came before, but also dares to do something new with the characters. Ideally, the balance of familiarity and surprise should be just right. And when it comes to that balancing act, Ori and the Will of the Wisps stands with some of the best sequels ever. One of the things that makes this game feel fresh is the brand new setting. Ori and Ku are strangers in Nywin, which definitely has some similarities to Nibble from the first game, but also comes with a whole new set of friends, foes, and challenges. Naru and Gumo are still here, but the focus of the story rests squarely on Ori's relationship with Ku. And while the opening sequence of Ori and the Will of the Wisps doesn't pack the devastating punch that the intro to the first game does, it takes that time to lovingly build up the relationship between Ori and Ku, so that you can really feel why Ori would fight so hard for their tiny feathered friend. By placing a friendship at the center of the game, Ori and the Will of the Wisps is able to build emotional investment really quickly, even if you never played the first game. Yet one of that first game's major strength was its empathy for every character, including Kuro, who was a terrifying villain right up until the introduction of her crazy sad backstory. And it seems for a minute like Shriek, the sequel's main villain, is going to be a retread of that arc. I even said, wait a minute, another owl out loud when Shriek was introduced. But I was foolish to doubt Moon Studios. Shriek feels like a deliberate counterpoint to Kuro, similar, but ultimately its own thing. When her backstory finally arrives, it goes in a totally different but equally heartbreaking direction. And it provides a new angle on the way Ori interacts with the world. In the first game, their kindness was able to solve nearly every problem. But in this game, Ori learns to fight for those friendships, which reflects the game's more combat-driven vibe. I did my first playthrough of Ori and the Will of the Wisps on the normal difficulty, which allowed me to soak in the story, music, and the incredible art design as I went. The atmosphere of the first game is totally here 
here, with the soundtrack and art design carrying over seamlessly from the first game. But there are enough differences early on to make it clear that it's not just a repackaging of the first game. Because combat in the first game was fine, but blasting enemies with energy bolts didn't require any real finesse. The spirit blade in this game, however, requires a more hands-on approach to enemies and boss fights. And yeah, there are boss fights, which are pretty much totally absent in the first game. And guess what? They're really goddamn good, with each fight having several stages or big cinematic moments, like a fight against a giant spider that's so hectic and thrilling, I couldn't wait to do it again on subsequent playthroughs, and that's saying a lot, because I hate spiders let alone giant spiders. They even fixed my biggest problem with the first game, which was the incredibly hard, extremely long escape sequences that you had to start from the beginning over and over and over and over and over and over and, over and well, you get it. They're still here, but now those escape sequences are either way shorter or tied to boss fights, which goes a long way towards making those bosses feel like a threat. But those boss characters are big surprise, still characters with their own wants and motivations. This is true of all the side characters, like Quolock the Frog, who serves as a big bulky mentor figure to the tiny Ori, as well as to the Moki inhabitants of Nywin, who he's taken under his wing. Not that frogs have wings, but you get it. There are Moki scattered all throughout the game, most of whom have side quests for you, or just little segments of flavor that fill in Nywin's backstory. The central village hub is positively bursting with weird little characters, like a lizard man who keeps track of all your stats for you. Thanks, man. It makes the side quests feel like an integral part of the game, because helping those adorable little guys and their big froggy friend means more than just defeating Shriek and restoring the light to the forest, but actually helping them out with their day-to-day -day lives. All the collecting feels familiar from the first game, but with new items like the mysterious seeds and Gorlek ore to help rebuild the hub village. It's even more rewarding. This is a big benefit of the game's expansion. The first game didn't really have any room for little side quests and NPCs like this one does, but it makes the world feel fully inhabited. And while I don't want to spoil the game's ending, I was genuinely moved by it. Ori and the Blind Forest opened up with its big emotional punch, but Will of the Wisps builds that emotion steadily until suddenly you're super invested in all these weird little creatures and just want them to live their best lives. As I played, collected things, and completed my challenges, my investment in the new characters grew bit by bit, and my investment in Ori and the others from the first game was expanded. Some of that comes down to the design, which is as gorgeous as it was in the first game, but it's also just good storytelling. Even though the friendship between Ori and Ku was new to this game, I cared because Ori cared, and because of my interest in Kuro's story from the Blind Forest. The game takes place in a land unfamiliar to both Ori and the player. Nywin is so full of odd and specific and yeah, adorable characters that it really leaves you no choice but to care for them all. I mean, just look at that tiny baby owl and tell me you wouldn't defend that thing with your entire goddamn life. All you are standing freaking Baby Yoda over here. I'll do anything for Ku, you precious baby bird. The first Ori and Hollow Knight games are arguably the best two Metroidvanias of the past five years. And I've made no secret so far of the fact that this sequel borrows a lot of ideas from Hollow Knight. And you know what? Good. Because Ori and the Will of the Wisps feels like a follow-up to not just the first game, but to every Metroidvania game ever made. It takes the best that the genre has to offer, going all the way back to Castlevania and Metroid, throws in a dash of other innovative entries into the genre, like Dead Cells, and presents it in one glorious package. Because yes, this is a genre that came out of the gate fully formed. But there have been so many attempts to refine and redefine it over the past few years, with Ori and the Blind Forest and Hollow Knight standing as the two most major examples. I mentioned that Will of the Wisps not only features swordplay, but a shard system similar to Hollow Knight's charms. But here's the thing. This is an extremely good system, 
It's versatile and allows players to make choices based on any given moment or situation and provides great incentive to collect everything because a new shard might totally change the way you play. Especially considering that Ori and the Will of the Wisps puts way more focus on aiming based projectiles than its predecessor did. You have so many long range options that you can approach combat any way you want. And it felt like a way to harken back to more projectile focused Metroidvanias like uh, well, Metroid. You can also test all of those new abilities at combat shrines, and between those and the boss fights, the Hollow Knight influence is even more clear. There's even a healing move that lets you expend spirit energy in favor of health. Yet these combat challenges never quite reach the extreme that they do in that game. All of the challenges are tough, but doable, and combat never takes over or pulls focus away from the platforming. Because the combat is great, but it's in the platforming that both of the Ori games truly innovate. And that's because it's a given in Metroidvania is that you're gonna unlock new movement abilities that allow you to explore and access new areas. But making each of those abilities feel unique and versatile is much harder. Speaking of exploration, there's a map maker that helps you chart each new area in case you're looking for another bit of Hollow Knight influence. But again, it's a system that works, so I can't fault them for it. And in a game that's so focused on exploration, it makes sense. The bash move from the first game still feels great to use, freezing time for a moment before launching off of an enemy or projectile. And in conjunction with the other moves, Ori can pull off combos that are truly crazy and can be used in either combat or traversal. And there are other traversal challenges too, with shrines that you can race between in order to earn rewards. It makes a lot of sense given how much of the game's focus is on bouncing, dashing, and launching all over the goddamn place. There's plenty of new abilities, like a digging power that launches you through soft dirt, and a water dash that seems lame at first, but radically changed my approach to water levels. The exploration is so rewarding because there are so many ways to get around. I equipped a shard that let me do a triple jump, and suddenly I felt like I could go anywhere. And if you mix those with new moves like a grapple ability or a launch that lets you freeze time without being near an enemy, you can chain all of these things together. It makes the huge amount of collecting feel an integral part of the game. Getting all of the seeds, Gorlek ore, quest items, health upgrades, and spirit upgrades sounds like a lot, and it is but it's mostly an excuse to stretch your abilities and explore every little inch of this incredibly detailed world. All of which is to say, Ori and the Will of the Wisps isn't a clone of Hollow Knight or even a clone of the very first Ori game. It strategically pulls elements from a wide variety of games to create something that feels new, but also comforting and familiar, just like a great sequel should. Honestly, the only thing that stops me from calling Ori and the Will of the Wisps a contender for the best Metroidvania ever is a couple of technical issues, and the feeling that it could have been just a little bit more polished. The game stutters sometimes when there's a lot going on, and there was one moment where Ori just full on disappeared from what was supposed to be a highly emotional cutscene, which ruined the moment for a bit. All of which is fine, but my big problem right now is with a few glitches that are affecting the game's biggest completion challenges. So both the original Ori and Hollow Knight have various levels of engagement. You can just play through the story if that's your thing, or you can do the craziest completionist challenges and get all the achievements if you're a glutton for punishment, which we all know that I am. Ori and the Will of the Wisps carries that spirit into its achievements, which are pretty wild. A deathless run, a speed run, and a couple of more specific challenges like beating that bonkers spider boss I mentioned without taking a single hit. But with some strategic saving, a little patience, and a dash of luck, I managed to do it all. Despite this game mostly being larger and more difficult than the original, I made it through a deathless run with way less frustration this time. Because sometimes the universe is just on your side. I beat the game in under 4 hours without equipping any shards and without a single death. I was so extremely proud of myself and so stoked that it didn't take me a million tries and then the achievements did not pop. It caused me a great amount of pain because you know that I love challenges like this, but I also love the recognition and the little sound my Xbox One makes when I pop an extremely difficult achievement, it's like drugs. But it was not meant to be. 
Moon Studios apparently knows about this and is working on it, so I'm looking forward to when it's fixed. In the meantime, at least there's that helpful little lizard to help keep track of everything for me. Except he's glitched too with a couple of little question marks on the stat screen that were supposed to go away as I already discovered those shrines, but they never did. And really, these things are only an issue if you're a completionist, because the core experience of playing through the story is still amazing and it can't be ruined by a couple of hiccups. But it is a bit frustrating because this game is so close to being perfect, like actually perfect, you guys. I'm not just being hyperbolic either. That's really how impressed I was through multiple playthroughs. Even when I was going through it on hard mode or dashing through a speedrun without dying, the visuals and music were stunning. Even without being able to stop and breathe, the characters still pop and the world feels totally alive. The platforming is next level good and the combat is consistently fun. I was always a little bit worried that the game couldn't keep up with its own excellence. Like every time I opened the map and it had to think for a little while. Or when I reached the end of the game's ultimate challenge and didn't get rewarded with my sweet, sweet achievement. In the long run, these complaints are minor and wouldn't stick out so much if I didn't love literally everything else about this game so much that it makes my heart want to burst. And honestly, I can't wait until these things are fixed because then I'll have no reservations at all about calling Ori and the Will of the Wisps a true masterpiece. All of the biggest challenges in Ori and the Will of the Wisps are tied to achievements. So maybe it wouldn't have bothered me so much that the late game achievements didn't pop if there were another major reward to distract me. But there's a pretty steady stream of little rewards throughout the game. Finding new shards always feels great. And when you get new seeds or ores, you get to tangibly affect the game's central hub in a way that made it feel really fun for me to monitor my progress as I went. And on my playthrough on normal, I made sure to do everything because I love looking at a fully completed map in a game like this. I also love a good inventory screen, and the one in Ori and the Will of the Wisps is one for the ages. All of the quest items and titular wills of the Wisp are visible, but I really like the little lights on the bottom of the screen that mark your progress with side quests and building projects. Between that, the stat screen, and the pause screen that adds constellations for each boss and area that you complete, this game has plenty to offer for completion nerds like myself on that first playthrough. But without the achievements, playing through it all over again and again for speed run, deathless run, and so on, felt anticlimactic. Fortunately, the game itself is strong enough that I don't mind having played through it so many times. Do I want those achievements? Yes, of course I do, so very badly. But is playing through Ori and the Will of the Wisps its own reward? Also yes, even with the achievements glitching or playing through without dying can't put a damper on how impressive this game is. I can see myself returning to it again not too long from now. It's just such a pleasant experience, even when it's difficult, and the soundtrack is going to be in constant rotation for a while. So yes, I do have some things to complain about, and I have, but even if I think the game could have benefited from another month in the proverbial oven, it's still a must play. And although I don't know if I can recommend going for every single one of these achievements, especially knowing that right now they might not register, it's still definitely worth at least one playthrough to enjoy the world, the story, and the characters of Ori and the Will of the Wisps. While I played Ori and the Will of the Wisps, there were 73 deaths, 40 pieces of Gorlick ore collected, 31 shards unlocked and fully upgraded, six mysterious seeds planted, 26 hours of total playtime, and one beautiful friendship between a tree spirit and a baby owl. And if you don't think that's adorable as hell, well then your heart is broken. What's wrong with you? So when you truly love a game and a sequel comes out, you don't want to set your expectations too high, right? You want to remember what you loved of the first game while looking fondly towards the second game with all the confidence and all of the hope and desire you'd want this sequel to feel. You want your expectations to be met, hopefully. But in the case of Ori and the Will of the Wisps, my expectations were blown sky high. It takes everything I loved about the first game and expands on it from a narrative perspective, from a gameplay perspective, from a visual perspective, and just really makes this world that's been established bigger, prominent, and wonderful. 
And while I do wish that at this time that the game was less glitchy and that the achievements that I worked very, very hard for actually worked and were deserved, I gotta give my props where props were due. Ori and the Will of the Wisps is a fantastic game that I cannot stress enough that all of you at home at the very least should try out. So, with that in mind guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It! That's all the time I have for today guys, so please as always let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like the show, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, click the bell, and check all notifications to be on. And not just personal, I promise to not bug you with crap. We do new videos every Wednesday and every Saturday. Stay safe, protect yourselves, practice social distancing, happy Animal Crossing and Doom Weekend. I know a lot of you guys are playing that. Uh, I'm gonna be dabbling in that as well. And at the very least, if you wanna see more of me, head over to twitch.tv slash thecompletionistguys. I've been Gerard, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.